Hello, this is Dr. James Camp from Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and this is the Cardiac Cycle and the EKG. Got a lot of learning objectives to cover today. The electrical conduction system, the uh, cardiac conduction system producing coordinated heart chamber contractions, the waveforms and the normal EKG, um, the parts of the cardiac cycle, systole and diastole, the um, phases of the cardiac cycle, including ventricular filling and ventricular ejection. Um, relating the EKG to the cardiac cycle and explaining how atrial systole relates to ventricular filling, the opening and closing of the heart valves, and pressure changes in the heart chambers and the great vessels, and the heart sounds and relating them to the cardiac cycle. Okay, let's start with the cardiac conduction system. Brief review because we covered this last time. The SA node is the heart's primary pacemaker. It is faster uh, than all of the other nodes, so it tends to uh, emit a signal first, which tends to override all of the other signals that are, are working on building. Um, so it sets the pace of the uh, contraction in the atria, and then sort of overrides the timing of the AV node which then sends a signal down the bundle to the bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers which finally connect us to the cardiac myocytes in the ventricles. Okay. It's important, however, to know how those electrical events map to particular physical events if we're going to interpret the EKG in terms of physical things going on in the heart at the same time. The EKG, the electrocardiogram, is only ever going to show you electrical events. We have to interpolate the physical events uh, in between the various electrical events on the EKG. Okay, so what are those electrical events? Um, the first major happening is that the SA node fires, which leads to the atria depolarizing. Okay, that's um, after depolarization of a cardiac muscle, you know, leads to um, that same part of the muscle, the atria, contract. Okay, when a muscle is depolarized, it contracts. And that means then that the atria empty, when a heart chamber contracts, it's going to empty its blood. Where does it go? Into the ventricles. Okay, quick quiz for you here. Which valves have to be open for blood to move from the atria into the ventricles? which ones can still be closed at that point. Okay, while the atria are emptying, we have the AV delay, no electrical activity for up to about 200 milliseconds, and that allows time for the atria to empty into the ventricles. At the end of that delay, the AV node fires, sends a signal to the AV bundle, then the bundle branches, and finally the Purkinje fibers, which pass the muscle, which pass the signal on to the ventricles, the cardiac myocytes of the ventricles, which are going to depolarize. Now, depolarization of a muscle always leads it to contract, so the ventricles are now going to contract. Contraction of a heart chamber always leads that heart chamber to empty. And where is the blood going to go from the ventricles? Not back into the atria. It's going to go into the arteries. Now at the same time that the ventricles are depolarizing, 
the atria are repolarizing. Now, repolarization of a, uh, a muscle always leads that muscle to relax and relaxation of a um, heart chamber leads blood to refill that chamber. So we wait about 200 milliseconds for the plateau phase of the ventricles, and then the ventricles also repolarize. And once again, repolarization leads that ventricle to relax and begin to refill. And then we wrap back around to the start. The SA node fires again, and we have another heartbeat. Okay. At some point, it occurred to doctors that it was very difficult to understand what was going on in the heart if all we did was listen to the heart with a stethoscope. So they wanted some sort of mechanism that would uh, graph the activity of the heart beat to beat to beat, moment to moment to moment. And since all of the mechanical activity of the heart is triggered by electrical activity, it occurred to physicians that they could record the electricity passing through the heart and uh, graph that as a function of time. The original EKG, we didn't have the silver nitrate electrodes that they put on your skin these days to, to pick up electricity. So the very first EKG had a person putting uh, his hands and feet in buckets of salt water. And you can see little wires running from those buckets of salt water. Um, and then connecting um, ultimately to this machine over here, um, which would um, print the uh, electricity on a roll of paper as it uh, as the paper rolled. Today we have much more sophisticated ways of connecting the elect electrocardiogram. Uh, the typical idea is to place three electrodes on the patient, um, a positive electrode just under the left breast or under the left nipple if it's a man who doesn't have a breast, um, the negative electrode up here just under the right clavicle, and then a ground electrode under the left clavicle so that Electrical energy passing from negative to positive would go essentially from base to apex of the heart. Okay, this is called a three lead EKG because there are actually three different ways to graph this electricity negative to positive, negative to ground, and ground to positive. Um, and we get three different printouts depending on which lead we look at. Um, the negative positive lead is, is known as lead two, and that is the most common uh, EKG that's the, the classic EKG that's printed out in all the textbooks. Uh, nota bene, note for the good. Um, today, we don't even use a three lead EKG anymore. We use a 12 lead EKG. There are, um, six electrodes arranged in some pattern around the heart. Um, this one has them all to the um, the right and you know uh, medially and inferiorly to the heart. Um, and then the other four reference electrodes are put on the wrists and the ankles. When they did this for me, when I had my EKG, these were moved up onto the torso uh, to be closer to the heart, uh, but uh, they still had 10 stickers and we still got these 12 uh, readouts. Lead two still looks about like 
um, the standard EKG that we're about to learn about. Okay, so if we imagine that negative is living up here somewhere and positive is living down here somewhere, uh, we can start to graph an EKG. So the EKG starts out running along at a baseline amount. There's no magical number for the millivolts here. It just is wherever the, the equilibrium electricity for your body happens to be. Then the AV node fires, electricity spreads through your um, atria. That's positive electricity largely flowing in the positive direction. So we get a positive bump on our EKG. For some reason that has never been explained to me, uh, the early cardiologist started with the letter P and so they named this the P wave. Then for that AV delay, we have another period of inactivity in the, uh, the heart rate. And then the electricity fires down the AV bundle and the bundle branches. And that is again, positive electricity acting in a positive direction. So we get a massive positive deflection. Then that electricity passes back up towards the base of the heart through the Purkinje fibers, positive electricity moving in a negative direction brings our electricity back down. So that's the re resolution of that spike. Uh, there are also some little artifacts in here, possibly due to the repolarization of the atria at the same time. So we actually have kind of a down, downward spike at either end of this. These letters are now known after after P, we get Q, R, and S. So this is called the QRS complex. While we wait on the plateau of the ventricles to, to take its course, we have another flat line. And then we have the repolarization of the ventricles. Repolarization is negative electrical energy, but it's moving in a negative direction. So negative of a negative is a positive, we get another positive hump on the EKG here. And that is our T wave. Then we get back to another flat line until it's time for the next P wave and the next heartbeat to start. Over time, cardiologists have defined a number of important segments, intervals, etc., in the electrocardiogram. We've already mentioned the P wave, T wave, and QRS complex. The two flat lines in between them are called the PQ segment and the ST segment, but we don't actually talk about those much. What we usually talk about are the PR interval, which includes the P wave and the flat line after it, and that is the atrial portion of the heartbeat. And then the QT interval includes the QRS complex, the flat line after it, and the T wave, and that is the ventricular phase of the heart rate. And each of these intervals has a particular time that you're looking for, and it can be prolonged or foreshortened. Um, QT prolongation is a common side effect of a number of medications that can lead to um, patients feeling sluggish or low energy or like they don't have enough blood circulation. Um, and then finally, the RR interval, what I call the pirate interval, RR, um, is uh, the time between heartbeats. So you can take 60, 60 seconds per minute, divide it by um, RR seconds per heartbeat, and you get heart rate in beats per minute. Okay, now to analyze the cardiac cycle, 
and compare it to the EKG, we need to understand a little bit about pressure. Pressure is a measure of how hard a unit of fluid pushes out on its neighbors. So let's say we have a little bit of fluid here. It's going to push out in all directions on its neighbors with a certain amount of pressure, P. Now, if something was pushing hard on you, what would you do? You might push back. And in fact, that's what we see is that the neighboring bit of fluid pushes back with equal pressure. Or you might move out of the way. And that's something we also see is that if the pressure is high over here and low over here, there's a bulk movement of fluid away from the high pressure toward the low pressure. Okay, so three things to know about pressure or fluids. When you push or squeeze on a fluid, it pushes back and it pushes back in all directions. So if we have our little unit of fluid and we apply a force on it in this direction, maybe squeeze on the plunger of a syringe or something, it's going to push back, but it's going to push back in all directions. The fluid becomes pressurized. So P heads out in all directions. A fluid will always move then from high pressure to low pressure. If um, over here we have fluid with lower pressure, then the result of putting that force on here is that this fluid is going to set up a flow from high pressure to low pressure. And pressure gets used up as fluid flows so that if you have a, a defined length of pipe, such as a blood vessel, um, and you exert a high pressure at one end, it's going to get less and less as we go on, and you'll have a smaller pressure coming out the other end. That's important to keep in mind when we talk about how blood pressure changes through the body. The more blood vessels that blood has traveled through, the lower its blood pressure is going to be at that point. Okay, the other basic background we need are a couple of definitions. Systole is where contraction leads to increased pressure, which leads to emptying of blood. So in systole, we have a chamber. It is contracting. So the pressure inside is increasing. So if we have a little vent from that chamber, an open heart valve, um, fluid is going to empty from that chamber. The opposite of systole is diastole, in which relaxation leads to decreased pressure, which leads to filling of blood. So in this case, we have a chamber which is relaxing. So its, it's walls are expanding a little bit. That's going to lead the pressure inside to fall. And if we have an opening there, fluid is going to flow in to fill that chamber. So the nifty thing about this is we can talk about contraction, increased pressure, and emptying of blood all with one word, systole. And we can talk about relaxation, decreased pressure, and filling of blood with one word, diastole, which now means we can define the cardiac cycle. We start with our heart 
looking kind of heart shaped. Okay, but then the first stage of the cardiac cycle, atrial systole happens. The atria contract. I forgot to draw my uh, my boundaries between my chambers here. The atria contract. So the walls collapse down. That increases the pressure in there, pushes open the atrioventricular valves, and leads to blood flow from atria to ventricle. By the end of this, we have rather flattened looking atria, rather swollen looking ventricles. Okay. Um, now, stage two, ventricular systole is about to happen. Here, the ventricles are going to collapse, contract, okay? That's going to raise the pressure in the ventricles, and blood is going to shoot out through the great vessels, which I forgot to draw in this, this drawing. At the same time, the atria are relaxing okay because their systole is over then we get to stage three ventricular diastole we start with the ventricles all contracted in, but the ventricles are going to relax, and that's going to lead to blood flowing into the atria and from the atria into the ventricles. And then we're ready for another atrial systole to happen and another whole cardiac cycle. Okay, we can break that down even further by identifying isovolumic and non-isovolumic uh, ejection and filling aspects of, of the ventricular systole and ventricular diastole. So that breaks us into five portions of the cardiac cycle. And we're gonna talk about that real quickly with um, we're going to have four things on each of these slides. We're going to have um, contraction or relaxation. We're going to have pressure. We're going to have valves. And we're going to have flow. Okay. So in the first stage, atrial systole, the atria contract briefly. For about 100 milliseconds that means pressure increases in the ventricles in the atria where it's still rather small in the ventricles so atrial pressure is greater than ventricular pressure so blood is going to want to flow from atria to ventricles and in order to do that we have to push open the AV valves while at the same time the semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonary valves remain closed. In early ventricular systole, the atria now relax while the ventricles, well the ventricles ventricle, yeah, while the ventricles contract. Ventricular pressure increases, so we now have a big pressure here in the ventricles and a smaller pressure 
everywhere else. That means fluid is going to want to, well, ventricular pressure is going to increase. Fluid is going to want to leave the ventricles, but the pressure here is not yet enough to open the semilunar valves. It is enough to close the AV valves. So the AV valves close, but there's no flow of blood right now. And that's called isovolumic, isosame volume. As the AV valves close, however, they make the first heart sound. Every time, um, every time a heart valve closes, it makes a sound. But these are soft, wispy valves, so they make a softer sound. And that sound is usually pronounced lub. Okay. Late ventricular systole, the ventricles continue to contract. Now we have a very high pressure in the ventricles that pushes open the semilunar valves because the ventricular pressure is now greater than the arterial pressure. With a high pressure here and a lower pressure in the arteries, that means blood is going to flow from ventricles to arteries. Then we get to early ventricular diastole. The ventricles begin to relax. The ventricular pressure decreases, and with pressure decreasing, that means back pressure is applied to the semilunar valves, the semilunar valves close. Every time a heart valve closes, we get a sound. And that sound, this time, it's a, the semilunar valves are harder, tougher valves, so they make a harder sound that we pronounce dup. So the heart sounds are lub dup, lub dup, lub dup. Blood flows here, um, not into or out of the ventricles. Again, we have another isovolumic phase, but blood flows from the veins into the atria because the atria at this point are starting to relax enough that they're needing to refill. Finally, late ventricular diastole, all chambers are relaxed. Ventricular pressure is more or less equal to atrial pressure though it's actually ventricular pressure is slightly less than atrial pressure because the atria have been filling with blood. And so the AV valves open and blood flows from the veins into the atria. Sorry, from the veins into the atria and from the atria into the ventricles. Okay, so that's the cardiac cycle in 30 minutes. Uh, next up are lectures on blood pressure and cardiac output, the other two areas of the more kind of evaluative areas of cardiac physiology. Um, hope you enjoy those. Please, uh, if you leave, if you learn something from this, please leave a like and uh, tell your friends about it.